Let us meditate on the Word of God, please. This is from Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know where he was, yet he could not escape notice. And a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the child be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephata. That is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute to speak. May God bless this reading of this word. O oh, Divine Healer, we confess that sometimes we yearn for you to wave a magic wand on our wounded lives, to remove our pain, illness, and suffering. We hear the gospel story of the one seeking healing from Jesus and assume you will perform a similar miracle for all of us if we just pray hard enough, and we do pray. Open our eyes to recognize the teachings and tools you have given us with which to seek healing. In the midst of our afflictions and diseases, you whisper to us that wholeness requires self-care and rest. You nudge us toward caregivers who can support and advise us. You breathe into us energy to move and stretch and reach toward health. You place in us an urgency to seek justice so that all may enjoy adequate health, care. Renew our spirits in the midst of our diseases and afflicting spirits. Transform us, O Holy One, for the health of your creation. Amen. So given what all that has happened this week, I ended up changing our lectionary passage to the gospel reading uh, this morning. So it was changed at a late date, and I apologize for that. Um, and that prayer was written by Reverend Jenny Brown Daniel, another United Church of Christ minister from Texas who is now serving in Missouri and a good friend of mine. And it's beautiful. So would you pray with me? 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Are you a good witch or are you a bad witch? This is the question that Glenda, the good witch, asks Dorothy when her house has landed upon the wicked witch of the East in the magical kingdom of Oz. Glinda the good has just descended as a delicate pink bubble, her gown sparkling like a giant cupcake, her voice as high as a bell, yet again intoning, are you a good witch or are you a bad witch? It is clear from this very moment that in the land of Oz, there are two types of witches, perhaps two types of women. There are the good ones and there are the bad ones. Women can either be as soft and sweet as Glenda or as dark and shrill as the wicked witch of the West. And so it goes, not just for witches and the land of Oz, but for women of Tyre in our reading this morning, and even for women in our world today. Are you a nice lady or are you a witch? Angry, assertive, and emotional. And even for those of you of other genders, the trap is placed on good Christian folk as well. Are you a nice Christian? Or are you the difficult kind? The kind who makes trouble, who rocks the boat? You see, we learn either implicitly or explicitly from a very young age that nice Christians, especially nice Christian ladies, are never supposed to get angry. We are never to disrupt the peace and harmony and we are to preserve relationships at all costs. Nice Christians, and especially nice Christian ladies, are not supposed to assert ourselves. We are to remember to be meek, kind, and humble. And even in 2021, these ideas are unintentionally fed by liberal Christian theology, which is in turn fed in no small part by our image of Christ, or what theologians call our Christology. So let's do an exercise for a moment on Christology to find out what ours is. I want you to close your eyes unless you are listening to this while driving or operating heavy machinery. Do not close your eyes and take a deep breath and clear your mind. And I want you to imagine Jesus. What do you see? Do you see a man with a pure white robe? What about his race? What about his weight? What about even his facial hair? Does he have a calm, serene look on his face? Is he surrounded by lambs or children? Are his arms outstretched in some sort of gentle gesture? Now open your eyes. What you probably saw was a one-sided Jesus, ever gentle and ever peaceful. Most likely, you have no problem embracing his divinity, but beyond his body, his full humanity is hard to embrace. This is our Christology. But what if I were to remind you that there are all sorts of passages in the Gospels where Jesus is so burnt out from helping others that he becomes reclusive, just wanting to be alone? What if I were to remind you that Jesus gets so frustrated and short sometimes with the disciples that he would shout at them, calling them brood of vipers or Satan? 
What if I were to remind you that Jesus got so angry once he flipped over all the tables in the temple? And then, then we have our gospel passage this morning, and it is a doozy where Jesus goes so far that he actually uses a racial slur calling the Syrophoenician woman a dog to her face. Who is this Jesus that would say something like that? This Jesus does not fit into our Christology. This Jesus doesn't even fit into what we would call good Christian behavior. When we advise our teenagers What, WWJD, what would Jesus do? This is not the Jesus that we're imagining. We're imagining the one in our children's Bibles, surrounded by lambs. But here he is in a scene that Mark paints for us. A woman of Syrophoenician origin bowing down in the dust at Jesus' feet. And you can probably guess that a nice Syrophoenician lady does not approach a man, let alone demand something of him. But this one, she is willing to risk it all for her daughter, who is at home lying sick in bed. So she begs that he heals her daughter, and we can only imagine how the crowd would have shaken their heads in scorn at such assertive behavior from a woman. And at this point in his day or even his ministry, Jesus has just had enough. And he looks down at this unclean woman and says, let the children of Israel first be satisfied. It is not right to take their bread and throw it to the dogs. Wow. Did Jesus just call this woman a dog to her face? Clucking tongues from the crowd, what did she think would happen? Then the Syrophoenician woman does one of the most remarkable things in the entire Bible. It can only be compared to the moment when the great Moses seems to persuade God to change course and forgive the Jews in the book of Numbers. This unclean Gentile woman talks back to Jesus. Not only does she talk back, she gets him to change his mind. She retorts, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. At this, the crowd surely would have gasped. Eyes would have darted left and right and hands would have covered their mouths in shock. What on earth would Rabbi say to this? And when Jesus finally breaks the silence, he says something more perplexing than a parable. He says, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. Wait a second. Did they just hear him right? Did he just change his mind and reward her for talking back? What just happened? And from that moment on, the trajectory of Jesus' ministry completely changes. Jesus and the disciples now preach not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. The map of his ministry changes. And so you and I are here today. This unclean Gentile woman had no right to speak to the living God like that. But nevertheless, she persisted. And thereby, she not only secured health and healing for her daughter, but she also changed the course of history and the very mind of the incarnate God. So what does this perplexing story of the Syrophoenician woman mean for us today? Did Jesus use a racial slur as a strategic test of her faith? Did he use it as a teaching moment for the disciples and Jews? 
Or was he just having a really bad day and caught himself in it? Theologians disagree on this one, and you may disagree with me, but here's the truth. This is not the only human moment Jesus has in the Gospels. He gets grumpy. He gets tired. The disciples get on his nerves. And here, he has to correct himself. We have to acknowledge that Jesus is not only just fully divine, he is also fully human. And Jesus was fully human in order to show us the full truth about our own humanity. Through Jesus' anger, his griefs, his doubts, and in this story, we see his change of heart. We can see a blueprint for a wholehearted life that includes both humanity and a path to a higher self. So certainly we should be able to forgive ourselves and others for those moments when we are only human. And secondly, through Jesus' interaction with the Syrophoenician woman, we see our own inclinations to limit the life-giving message of the gospel. A message that doesn't just bring new life to one ethnic group, one religion, one political party, just to the unborn, or just to one gender. No, it is for the life of the whole world. Scripture tells us that the gospel brings life to both Gentile and Jew, slave and free, male and female, so that all might have life abundant. As Texan Christians, therefore, let us remember that any theology that places a priority on certain lives while turning a blind eye to women's suffering out of sight, like the Syrophoenician's daughter, is not a life-giving or pro-life theology at all. And this Labor Day, let us remember that any theology that gives bread to its own people while throwing only crumbs to the laborers under the table is also not a life-giving or pro-life theology at all. And last and most importantly, the Syrophoenician woman teaches us all to speak up, to persist in our asking, to talk back to the highest authorities, even to the living God, to demand health care and healing for our daughters, to speak up for women, and to advocate for more than just crumbs for those living on the margins. So no matter what the crowd might say about us, even if they gasp, call us emotional or angry, or say they expected better from good Christians, talk back like the Syrophoenician woman and demand better. Demand that all be given a seat at the table and not just be thrown crumbs like dogs because God gave us anger for a reason. Anger is our protector. Anger tells us when our values are being violated. And Christ blesses us when we talk back to such injustices. And that doesn't make you a bad witch. It makes you a good Christian, just like the Syrophoenician woman. Amen.